um, privilege of being has the privilege of being our Minister for Economic Development, Regional Development and Small Business, as well as the Minister for Forestry. Uh, today, he's going to talk to us about his aspirations for the next 18 months, how he views the role and progress of industry transformation plans and fostering regional economic development in the future. Stuart, welcome, and thank you very much for sharing your time with us this evening. Kia ora, tēnā koutou koutou, everyone on the call, and thank you very much for, uh, for taking your time to listen to me. Hey, look, it's great to be back in Queenstown. Uh, I was here virtually uh, last week. I gave a speech to the, um, the Queenstown Policy Council run by the University of Otago and, uh, and down there a couple of weeks ago with the Prime Minister. Um, it, as I mentioned when I was down a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I've, I've come to love Queenstown, actually. I think uh, you live in an absolutely beautiful part of the world. Having said that, I do acknowledge that a number of you have done it incredibly hard. And you know, what we have tried to do over the last two years is give you a level of, of fiscal support that at least mitigated some of the, you know, the, the major risks around having to close up shop. But, but I do acknowledge that uh, there are many in Queenstown that are really looking forward to the end of COVID. But anyway, thank you for inviting me today to talk at the Queenstown Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to take this opportunity as the Minister for Economic and Regional Development, Small Business, Tourism, to talk about the government's priorities for industry transformation plans, small business, regional economic development, and tourism. And if anyone has any forestry questions, I'm very happy to talk about those as well. As we know, and what I'll do, sorry, what I'll do is I'll speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll allow about 40 minutes for questions or comments. So we've got until, uh, until about 6.30, or well, as far as I'm concerned. Um, 2022, it's a critical time to focus on New Zealand's economic strategy. Uh, as we all know, the government took the hard decision to restrict entry to New Zealand in 2020. You know that uh, as well as anyone. But our health system is holding up and the health of New Zealanders, it appears, has been well protected. We've fared far better than many other countries and putting people's health first was also the strongest economic response. And we've been saying that for the last two years. And I think um, it's been borne out when you have a look at what's happened around the world. And there's no doubt that we're now feeling the full brunt of global headwinds. But our comparatively low debt, record low unemployment and record investments in infrastructure and skills development will all help us support our recovery. But I also know that uh, that, that also comes with some challenges, which we can talk about a bit later uh, as well. We are in a new place with Omicron, but with vaccination rates above 95% for two doses, rising number of booster shots and with a clear plan in place for the phased reopening of our borders, uh, we've turned what I believe to be a significant corner in the COVID-19 battle. And the thing I say for the first time in two years, that light at the end of the tunnel uh, is actually daylight and it's not a freight train heading our way. So doing the hard work together, uh, we are ready to welcome the world back to New Zealand and New Zealanders are ready to reconnect with the world. A successful rebuild from COVID-19 is not, however, about returning to the way things were before. And I've said this over and over again for the last uh, two years uh, and 18 months since I've been the Minister for Tourism, but certainly in the economic development portfolios as well. We need to rise to a greater challenge if we are to actually become one of the most aspirational tourist destinations in the world and providers of the world's premium global products. This means a move to a high wage, highly productive, low emissions economy for all. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But I hope this message doesn't come as a surprise because as mentioned, I've been saying this and articulating other aspirations for the industry um, publicly ever since I became the Minister of Tourism and the Minister for Economic and Regional Development 18 months ago. Firstly, I'd like to talk to you about our industry transformation plans and the role they will play in transforming our economy. Many other countries, Australia, Singapore, Canada, UK, have focused on industry strategies. And the Productivity Commission's Frontier Firms report emphasised that along with broad-based innovation policies, which benefit all firms, resources also need to be deliberately focused on a small number of high potential areas rather than being too thinly spread. That's why through our industry strategy, the government has decided to actively partner with business workers in Maori to transform sectors of the economy with the potential for significant productivity gains or where we currently have some form of global competitive advantage Increasing wages and improved well-being for all New Zealanders will be the outcome. Each ITP is long-term focused, creating a 20 to 30 year vision, is action oriented, identifying the actions that can be taken in the next one to three years to set the transformation in motion. And each industry is different, but the key task of each ITP is to identify what are the game-changing initiatives 
that can be implemented by industry and government. And I know that there are, um, there are people in Queenstown who are part of uh, our ITP teams. There are eight ITPs underway. These are, in, these are industries with significant potential, as mentioned, to contribute to the future economy that we desire and deserve to be. It might be through shifting an existing industry to high value growth, assisting a major industry in transition or scaling up a small or high potential industries to be part of our future economy. These ITPs are advanced manufacturing, agri-tech, digital technologies, tourism, construction, food and beverage, forestry, wood processing and fisheries. And the thing I will say is even though as the Minister of Economic Development, I have oversight over the whole ITP plan and am personally responsible for the advanced manufacturing uh, Damien O'Connor and I, the Minister of Agriculture, are responsible for Agritech. Uh, I have responsibility for tourism and forestry and wood processing. Other ministers also have responsibility for the other um, ITP. So this is an all of government um, uh, process. The ITPs are each at different stages of development. A number have been launched and exciting initiatives are already underway. Significant progress has been made across the program. For example, the Agritech ITP was launched in 2020, and in May last year, New Zealand Growth Capital Partners has already invested significantly in Finisterre's $40 million Agritech Venture Capital Fund to support firms' transition from R&D to commercialisation. The digital ITP has been out for consultation over the last month, and early initiatives like the New Zealand Tech Story and, and the Software as a Service community have recently been launched to showcase New Zealand's tech capability to the world and strengthen connections between established and startup firms in the sector. The Advanced Manufacturing ITP, the working groups and steering groups have completed the first draft that will be out for consultation soon. Look, I think if we have a look at what's happening around the world, we need to be very, very smart in what we do. You know, there's a line that says we can feed the world. Well, we can't. We can feed about 50 million people. So certainly in the, in the primary sector, I've always believed that we should be targeting only that ultra premium end of the market. Uh, but in order to do that, um, we've got to be really smart in the way we develop our brand, make sure we live those brand, um, uh, those brand objectives. But most importantly, that our brand has a level of integrity that will um, attract the, the engaged, the educated and the enabled consumers to pay a little bit more for stuff from brand New Zealand. Uh, and I believe, you know, let me give you one, one example. When I was Minister of Fisheries, I oversaw the cameras on fishing boats, and a lot of the industry thought this was about compliance. For me, it was, you know, there was a compliance element, of course there was. But there was also a really big marketing component to this. So when people in, you know, in China or Chicago or wherever bought New Zealand fish, they knew that they were buying fish from the only fully sustainably managed fishery in the world. It's these sorts of global competitive advantages that we've got to figure out where we can actually achieve and go hard. But this will take a full partnership between the government and industry and iwi. Uh, we'll be working across government portfolios together with our partners to deliver transformation through the ITPs. We will consider, for example, investment, innovation, infrastructure skills, and access to capital to provide an enabling environment and ecosystems to lift productivity, scale up, and create good, high-value jobs. While each ITP is industry-specific, of course, this work is allowing us to identify and leverage common challenges or opportunities. And in this way, the ITPs have the potential not only to transform individual sectors, but also to catalyze transformation in the wider economy. I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, tourism ITP shortly. Um, but, but I really see these as, as critical enablers of our global competitive advantage going forward. Small business support. Let me give you a little bit of a, uh, an overview of what's happening there. We know COVID-19 has been especially tough on a number of small businesses. At the firm level, we're focused on making it easier for firms to do businesses as they help New Zealand transform. We do this by focusing on a number of things. Internationalization and innovation as major growth enabling activities. Lifting dynamic management capabilities to be more productive and more sustainable and inclusive. Ensuring challenges of our shallow capital markets are addressed so that firms have the finance they need to grow. Supporting SMEs to thrive and grow and particularly to build their capability to undertake digital commerce and reduce regulatory burdens for businesses to make it easier to do business with government. And I've been saying this uh, 
for, you know, we, I've been the Minister of Small Business for four and a half years. And, um, uh, and I probably said this in, in Queenstown, Ruth, when I came down, but I've always believed that this is possibly the last generation of business owner, small business owner, that will survive, let alone thrive, without being digitally enabled. And while COVID has brought challenges and disruptions, small businesses have shown their resilience and ability to, to adapt. And the uptake of businesses using government plat platforms to help do businesses more effectively is increasing. And what I would urge anyone to do who, is, who, you know, who doesn't know how to start that digital journey or who has started that digital journey but wants to continue and build a lot further, then I would go to the Digital Boost program. This is an amazing program designed to build digital capability among our small businesses, and it continues to grow. There's, a, there's, about, there's nearly 45,000 small business trainees signed up, representing nearly 28,000 businesses. And the Business Connect platform, which streamlines the firm's experience in dealing with government and multiple agencies, doubled its user base in 2021 to over 60,000 businesses. But, you know, there's a number of other stuff we've worked in. Capability support and reducing relatory burden through the New Zealand business number, better for business. Business Connect. Now, Business Connect, is a, as mentioned, fantastic platform. Business.gov.nz. Uh, I'm assuming there's a whole raft of business owners that have got the business.gov uh, newsletter. That is, that's sent out to around about 800,000 email addresses uh, and, and things like e-invoicing. But the reason I talk about the importance of digital enablement is everything the government is doing uh, in terms of small business innovation is based on digital platform. And that includes paying your taxes. Um, I, I would say in three years, you will not be able to deal with central or local government unless you are e-invoice enabled. And so, you know, I know there's a whole lot of people, and this includes me, uh, who you know, went through school when computers were there for the nerds. Um, computer and digital technologies are an integral part of not only doing but growing businesses. So go and have a look at that Digital Boost program if you're not aware of it, but you uh, you feel as if you need a little bit more upskilling in this. And it's free, of course. 2022 will be another busy year as we support SMEs to recover and rebuild from the impacts of COVID-19. And we're going to do this with, uh, you know, using some, some of these tools. So I talked about business.gov.nz. This will continue to provide advice to businesses. And so I would look out for this. Uh, the COVID-19 protection framework, and particularly for the Omicron variant, they send out a newsletter every time something changes. So if you see something come into your inbox from business.gov.nz, my advice is just open it up and take a look at it. Um, it really is fantastic information. Uh, we'll support SMEs to thrive and grow, and particularly to build their capability to undertake digital commerce by using free tools like Digital Boost Educate. Um, we're, we're launching something called Digital Boost Check uh, Checkable. And this is a tool to provide small business owners with a customized digital action plan that will enable them to make informed, competent decisions about the next steps on their business digital journey. Um, one of the things that I have the privilege of doing is I chair the OECD's Digital for SMEs Working Group. And so I get to, to see what um, other countries around the OECD are doing in terms of their digital support. And every single country recognizes the value, but also the necessity and the urgency of providing tools for their SMEs to allow them to go global, but certainly work digitally. So this is one of these things where if we don't get it, then we'll miss out on opportunities, but we can... Um, you now we can be ahead of the game in a lot of the work that's, um, that's going on. In fact, there's a number of countries, including the OECD organization, that have taken a look at our digital boost and want to see how they can adapt it to, uh, to work in their countries. Um, we're also going to work to improve access to finance for SMEs. And the Minister Grant Robinson and I are working to ensure that the challenges apparent through our capital markets are addressed so that firms have finance they need to grow. So you know, watch the space on this. We're also requiring central government agencies to pay 95% of their invoices within 10 days. And certainly if a business is e-invoice enabled, and if you're on my or zero, you, you can be, uh, then you'll get paid probably a little bit earlier than 10 days, to be honest. Uh, in addition, we're making changes to the Small Business Cash Flow Loan Scheme to increase the amount of funding available to eligible SMEs with 50 or fewer uh, FTEs through the introduction of the top-up loan for an additional $10,000. And the maximum total loan now available is 110,000 for a firm of 50 FTE, with a sole trader being able to access 21,800 in total. Cabinet's also agreed recently to remove the first two years of accrued base interest from all borrowers who have or will 
take out a loan under the scheme. Pushed hard for that one. Um, let me talk about regional economic development priorities. Uh, look, we are um, we're committed to ensuring New Zealand is in the best possible position to build a thriving, productive, inclusive economy. You'll have heard those words ever since Labor took over. Uh, one of the pillars of the strategy is to strengthen our regional economies. This will help with the communities and businesses in those regions, help them to grow, creating a solid base and with it, jobs. I mean, I tell the story, I'm the, I'm the MP for Napier. Uh, I'm one of four kids uh, and I'm, my parents still live in Napier, but I'm the only one who's come home. Uh, but even before I came back to Napier, you know, I used to say, well, there aren't the sort of jobs I do here. So I left at the end of the seventh form, bowing and declaring never to come back, saw the world, and I worked around the country. And then when I was looking to settle down, you know, I, I ended up in Napier and I absolutely love it. I've got four children of my own. I would love them to get, you know, to get educated, go and see the world, experience what life's about and, you know, beyond our shores. But I would also love them to consider coming back to Napier when they want to settle down. But in order for them to be able to do that, there's got to be the jobs. And so this is a really big priority for the government. We're enduring this by accelerating investment into the regions, helping initiatives that support national government priorities, it's a small end obviously, uh, so they can strengthen their local economies. Last year, we reached a significant milestone with the government investment in regional economic development projects since 2018, paying out $2 billion for approved projects. Their support for jobs, businesses, and infrastructure steps up a gear. While the $2 billion achievement is impressive, it's only half the story. There is another $2 billion in investment still in the pipeline. So this money's been appropriated, it's been, been approved, but it's in the pipeline, which we paid out over the lifetime of these projects. And there's about, you know, there's over 1,700 projects up and down this fantastic country. But simply put, we're aiming to improve community prosperity by helping create a step change in the regions to, incre to increase uh, economic activity. And we're doing this because our regions are an important part of New Zealand's economy. You know, we used to hear if Auckland's doing well, the country's doing well. I, I flip that on my head. I think if our regions are doing well, then the country's doing well. Yet despite their importance and contribution to our national good, sadly, I believe the regions have been neglected for details. And as mentioned, I'm a provincial boy. Now I'm gonna get political for one, one second. And it's worth noting that in 2016, I'm, I've got to say this, the previous national government had publicly stated that they planned to invest $94 million over four years to 2020 in across our regions. So I think that our $4 billion trumps us, including improving New Zealand's infrastructure, a vital part of our regional investment plan and spending, which was long overdue. So 94 million versus 4 billion, ask yourself. Anyway, the sad fact is that New Zealand has a huge infrastructure deficit. Some economic experts put this deficit at an eye-watering $75 billion, about a quarter of our annual GDP. What it means is that New Zealand is still consistently ranked below Australia and other OECD nations in terms of infrastructure spending. We're improving the situation and have already put nearly a billion dollars into more than 100 rail and road projects. We're upgrading art galleries, museums, establishing food hubs and laying down ambitions, ambitious new cycleways. And you know, some of the things that I've been doing down in Queenstown are looking at your cycleways, man, they're, they're, they're impressive. But we're backing innovative scientific research and engineering projects and building new factories. And importantly, in these times of rapid climate change, communities are being protected from floods and rising sea levels. Certainly the Queenstown Lakes District has played an important role in our regional economies, but its reliance on a few key industries, including um, international tourism, has left it economically vulnerable. And I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but as we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to improve the region's resilience and we're doing just that by supporting the development of other sectors. We don't expect Queenstown to do this on its own. And that's why in May 2021, I announced a $20 million fund over three years for a Queenstown Economic Transformation and Resilient Fund to develop alternative industries in and around this district. My ambitions for the fund are for it to grow existing businesses, which are not tourism or construction focused, whilst also attracting new talent. And I note that one of my... Uh, Maybe Boys High School uh, school colleagues who was here ahead of me, Rod Jury, has made his home down in Queenstown and is a you know, very staunch Queenstown advocate, but also an investor in the region as well. But this requires a tailored approach, building a critical mass, there, there you go, name dropping, 
but it requires a tailored approach, building a critical mass of new industry to encourage growth through greater opportunity. Since my original announcement in May last year, my officials have been working with local stakeholders to support diversification in the district, including into such industries as film and tech. And a number of exciting opportunities in these sectors have already been identified, and I can't wait to take these to my fellow decision-making ministers on this fund for them to consider. Our regional economic development agency, it's called uh, Kanoa RDU, is also supporting a great local initiative and in homes for healthier business, which will create a platform to encourage more outside businesses and individuals to set up office in the district. We're also aiming to help employers access emerging talent from tertiary providers and ensure there is a sufficient accommodation for workers to move to the district. And while I'm not downplaying the importance tourism plays to the Queenstown, Queenstown district, and it always will be a fantastic world leading world-class tourism sector, what the new fund aims to achieve is to build a more resilient region, better able to weather any future economic shocks. Let's talk about tourism. With the borders opening, we hope to see a return of international visitors. The recent decision by Cabinet to allow fully vaxxed travellers from Australia from the 12th of April and visa waiver countries like the US, UK, Singapore, Japan and others from the 1st of May, without needing to self-isolate, is a huge step forward for international tourism since last year's trans tasman bubble. And in fact, the, uh, Queenstown was the first place the PM visited after making that announcement. And the reconnection with Australia is obviously huge. Prior to COVID-19, Australia was New Zealand's largest international visitor market, accounting for almost 40% of all international visitor arrivals. And the government's provided an unprecedented level of support for the tourism sector over the past two years in recognition of its importance to our national economy and local communities. Since we opened the border to working holiday makers on the 13th of March, we have approved over 2,500 visas on top of the 18,000 granted to previous holders of the working holiday visas that were unable to use them due to border closure. And I think, and I thank Queenstown and you, Ruth, for your advocacy on this. It was, a, it was certainly the catalyst that, um, that got us thinking around what we could do to keep those 18,000 people in the country. The government has invested heavily and strategically, maintaining New Zealand's international air connectivity at, at huge cost, but it's protected our connections to key partner destinations, as well as seeking to address future passenger carrying capabilities. We spent $600 million on targeted tourism support over the last two years, which quickly rises into the billions when general support for the tourism and hospitality sector is included, such as wage subsidy and resurgent support payment. We invest in Maori tourism and, uh, and uh, we provided $46 million in funding to regional tourism organisations since 2020, so they can develop innovative tourism strategies based on the concept of regenerative tourism. And I, I gave them a, a, just a gentle serve uh, when I spoke last Friday at the um, Otago Tourism Policy uh, School. You know, we, we started giving these guys money two years ago. And what I absolutely expect to see is good destination marketing plans based on regenerative tourism. Now, there's about half of them that haven't done them, but this is really important. Again, it's about building uh, our global brand, but more than that, it's about living our global brand and actually um, maintaining our social license to operate as an industry within our communities. Hence the reason we've, you know, we need to strengthen links into our communities to help coordinate the kind of actions that are required at the local level. Um, our commitment to support individuals, businesses and sectors continues to this day through the COVID-19 support payment and obviously through the, um, through the Kickstart Fund. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, hopefully everyone's aware that with changes to border settings, the imminent arrival of international visitors, the, my $49 million tourism Kickstart Fund for the five South Island communities hardest hit by the loss of international visitors will help provide businesses with a grant between $10,000 and $50,000 to assist in refreshing facilities, marketing, training, and hiring new staff, or sourcing new stock and readiness for opening. Look, I, we understand that ramping back up for business will take time and money, and is exactly what the Tourism Kickstart Fund is for. It opens in a couple of days on the 1st of April. And it's part of three business initiatives available in the five communities that, was launched, that were launched last year. I'm sure you're aware of the other two. Um, while we prepare for our intimate reconnection to the wider world, we must continue to plan for the future. Tourism operators should absolutely be looking to harness unique innovations in the industry, increasing the use of technology such as electric vehicles, accessible websites and virtual reality are all within reach right now. Um, on top of this, I'm investigating the possibility of a tourism innovation fund. This came up when I was down 
in Queenstown last time. I think it's a fantastic idea, uh, but I'm just looking at what looking at what this would look like, and I'll talk about this more um, at a later date. As mentioned, we've got the tourism ITP industry transformation plan up and running. The first focus is on better work for the tourism sector. So we're looking at the um, at workforce issues and how we can come up with solutions. Um, we've got a, a few of your people, um, Bridget from Real New Zealand, Trent from ZipTrek Ecotours and Charlie from Queenstown Resort College are on that ITP. And I thank you for um, your work if you're on the call. Um, the ITP second phase, whilst I said the first phase is going to be on the workforce, the second phase is going to be on the environmental impact. And we're working to there. And we've also committed to making improvements to freedom camping. And, and it wasn't the last time I was in Queenstown. I think it was the time before, maybe the time before that. Uh, I had a look at the, the work that the Queenstown District Council has done with their freedom camping site on, you know, on the lakefront. Fantastic. I take my hat off to you. I think that's a, an amazing initiative win. In tough times, it might have been you know, easy for the council to sell that land down. No doubt it's worth an absolute fortune. But the fact that they've left that aside for, for ordinary kings who can't afford to stay in a, you know, in a flash hotel, I think, is, is amazing. Um, but there's still a parliamentary process to go through with the freedom camping stuff. But I'm hoping it'll be in place for, um, uh, for next summer. But as international visitors return, we can't allow ourselves to fall back into the old ways. And I'm adamant about this. It doesn't help our communities, our kids, or ultimately tourism as a whole. And it certainly won't allow us to become the premium destination we have the potential to be and what I have articulated over the last 18 months that I'd like us to see, uh, see us become. Um, there's real potential in the tourism industry uh, to become low carbon, high skilled, high wage, to lead the world in this area, to be number one. Um, just to close, uh, while the last two years have been tough for businesses across the country, particularly here in, in Queenstown, the challenges also present, present us with a huge opportunity for change. It, it, they really do. Um, look, I know that I'm, I'm speaking quite quickly. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Uh, I've only got 20 minutes and I've already taken half an hour. Um, but I'm happy to elaborate <laughs> in a slower cadence uh, on some of the things that I have spoken about. But the last thing I want to say is we open up to the rest of the world again. We must take this opportunity to shift our economy to a high wage, high productive, low emissions economy for all. As I've just outlined, there's a significant amount of work across all my portfolios to transform our economy. Working together with industry and businesses, I'm aspirational for the opportunities we can create by better understanding our global competitive advantages at the business level, the community and regional level and nationally, and then work hard to ensure we play to these, creating a unique selling proposition that helps people decide to buy New Zealand products and services and, uh, and certainly fly into Queenstown from wherever in the world they currently reside. And like I said, I do apologize if I was speaking a bit too fast there. There's a lot to cover. Uh, there is a lot going on in this portfolio, but I absolutely want to leave time, at least half an hour for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, we have had a number of questions submitted uh, through the registration process, but if there are any other questions that people have thought have thought of while the minister was speaking, please feel free to put these in the Q and A. But just to start off, um, Minister, uh, we talk about uh, obviously fostering regional economic development and outside of tourism. Uh, do you have a view on whether there is a role for an independent economic development agency in the district or the region, or do you think collaboration alone is sufficient to produce regional economic development? It's a really good question, and, and one thing I wouldn't suppose to do, Ruth, is tell Queenstown is how to how to conduct their business. But one thing I would say is uh, there is a point in time, and there's absolutely now, where uh, we have to stop talking and start doing. And as mentioned, I mean, in, in the $20 million fund that I put forward for uh, diversifying the economy, um, I don't think we've spent close to that $20 million. And I've said to my team, I would like to see some projects put before me and quickly. So, you know, there, there are advantages in having an independent economic development organization because it means that they're not necessarily behoven uh, to the council's objectives. Uh, they can look at things holistically um, obviously, the council is always going to be a major um, stakeholder, 
Um, but again, uh, there, there are certainly a merit to both, but, but I don't want to be seen to be standing here in the beehive and telling you what you have to do down in Queenstown. Uh, thank you. Uh, what are your views on active labour market assistance and how you see this playing a role in building economic resilience and prosperity? Noting your views about your desire to see change and transition, but obviously that is only delivered through people. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. I'm going to answer, give me three minutes to answer this, okay? Um, and you'll know where I'm coming from. So the predominant um, economic philosophy uh, for the last generation really has been the Washington Consensus. And that is about the government gets out of the way, let the markets do what markets do, and the government's only really intervene if there is market failure there or something's going terribly wrong. There's a new consensus that came out, and if you're interested in this, I would Google the Cornwall Consensus. It was the latest work that came out of the, the G7, so it's supported by the big, the big players in town. And it's a move from uh, the government has no role to play in the market unless there's failure to a much greater um, uh, role for government to play working proactively with markets to make sure we get the outcomes that are great for all our communities. And a, and a big part of that, Ruth, I think is, is active labour market interventions. And that is, um, again, you know, we're not going to stand back and let the market determine the best outcomes. We will work with market participants and players to determine best outcomes for all our communities. So there are no losers. And it's really what the ITPs are about. It isn't about the beehive or, or you know, the bureau, politicians in, in Wellington telling people what must be done, but nor is it um, us standing aside saying, it's up to you now, uh, you know, go forth and conquer and, you know, We'll see you next time there's a crisis. We absolutely need to work together, both in, in training, you know, the uh, apprenticeships have been, uh, been freed, 100,000 people up, um, uh, undertaking apprenticeships, um, but also working really hard to ensure those who aren't in work get into work. Thank you. Uh, you've talked about the Resilience and Diversification Fund and Home for Healthier Business, which are both great initiatives, but they are designed around uh, attracting existing businesses and also supporting commercial opportunities. It's great to hear that you are considering a, considering a tourism innovation fund. Uh, and obviously, you know, we're all aware that some things will, will go ahead and some, some things will work and some things, some things won't. Queenstown, as we know, faces a number of barriers to entry from its geography, distance to markets, housing affordability, et cetera. Is there an appetite to consider uh, investing in incentives to support the economic transition of the region? Well, well, I would argue that the, um, you know, the $20 million diversification fund is certainly incentives. If you're talking about a tax-free zone, or any tax incentives for people to ship down to Queenstown. No, we're not considering those sorts of incentives. Um, but you know, we I, I actually believe that, that Queenstown has a pretty powerful value proposition to attract people in. You know, talking to people like um, you know, Rod and Olivia and, and, and others who are thinking about how to really energize uh, Queenstown's innovation community. There are a lot of ideas out there. And what we're really keen to do, and this is where this $20 million fund came in, Ruth, is sit down with the thought leaders, including yourself, of course, the thought leaders in Queenstown and say, hey, you know, how do we work together to ensure that we can get businesses down here? Now, you know, we're not going to pay for moving bans, but we may underwrite rent or um, we may, um, you know, underwrite your, your, your two-year lease or we may help. With, with loans or equity to allow you to buy a kit that will take you to the next stage. So there are ways and means we can do this, but if you're talking about tax free zones, no, but if you're talking about loans, equity and other, other measures, then they're all on the table. Given the tourism sector is, is not overrun with cash reserves after the last couple of years, uh, is there potential in establishing a funding stream from ETS ring fenced funds to assist businesses making the capital investments um, that are necessary to result in reduced emissions. No, I haven't, haven't thought of that yet, but, but what I would say is that, uh, and I was talking to Damien O'Connor about this with regard to the agricultural sector. I think we're going to get to a place in the not too distant future when, when high value tourists, and, and I talk about high value tourists not, uh, a lot, that is distinct from high net worth, so please, um, understand that distinction. 
but high value tourists are going to ask the questions, is this a carbon neutral um, venture? Uh, are we coming to a country that values carbon neutrality or certainly reducing carbon emissions? And I think those who are innovating themselves will end up with some form of powerful competitive advantage. So I would urge anyone who has the ability to take carbon out of their business to do so, because I think that will help you um, gain some form of competitive advantage that, that high value tourists are going to be demanding in the not too distant future. You've spent a lot of time uh, in our region over, <laughs> over the, last, the last few years and, and met a number of, uh, number of the players and stakeholders and, and local residents. Um, what's your perception of the biggest barriers and opportunities for economic diversification in the region? Uh, I think your power supply. I mean, I came down there and did a week long uh, Institute of Directors course, and I'd heard about this power supply issue, that this is the integrity of the power coming across the, the ranges. And I think the power went off once or twice when I was there. And if you're running a really high tech business, you've got to have security of power. I think that's a, so, so infrastructure. And I'm, when I talk about infrastructure, it's not just roads and pipes. It's, um, you know, it's power and internet and all this fantastic stuff that will attract the, the really innovative high end um, investors and developers. Um, that, that's one of the things. I, I do think that uh, you afford a lifestyle that is attractive to a certain sort of person. And again, I don't mean to talk about this guy, but to me, he sort of epitomizes what I'm talking about. You know, Rod is out there, he's investing, but he loves his mountain biking, his surfing, and his water. Um, I've met a couple of other people, who, of entrepreneurs, and, and one American chef in particular, who is in Queenstown, but is working remotely because he loves the lifestyle. I mean, he's a, he's a skier and he's a mountain biker, but he's bringing up his kids there. So I think the lifestyle, the lifestyle um, proposition for investors is powerful. One thing I would say though, a real barrier is affordable accommodation. And I know um, in my role as a, as a member of cabinet, we've fast tracked a number of developments through the RMA process. They still have to go through other processes, of course. So I know that there are, you know, there are a number of houses either being built or on plans or have been built, but I do think um, uh, that is an issue in terms of allowing those who service key industries and certainly tourism to have a decent standard of living. Yes, well, even, even billionaires like to eat out at restaurants and cafes that, that have people who work in them um, that, uh, that, that need to live. Um, if the shovel-ready projects that were funded uh, within Queenstown, and we certainly appreciated the shovel-ready um, funding that was made available, were predominantly civil projects, which, you know, as we know, do not um, touch a, a huge array um, of uh, people, um, nor are huge economic contributors. Would there be the potential for the government to consider outside of innovation actually supporting innovation and in infrastructure like alternative power supplies or potentially alternative housing within the area? You know, I won't say no. I mean, give me a proposal and, and let's see where it leads. I mean, there's a number of things that we're considering as a government at the moment. And certainly if it, if it takes carbon out of the, uh, the environment and carbon out of our economy, then we're you know, there are a number of funds that are open to businesses uh, that want to achieve that. So that, that may go against what I just said earlier. But, but what I am talking about is, um, you know, is large scale projects and in terms of the shovel ready I, I do acknowledge a lot of them were, were civil but but you know all we did is approve projects that were given to us so um, you know, these were the projects that were presented we were happy to fund them and in a way we go but um, uh, look it's never out of the realms of possibility Ruth so let, let's look at innovative ways to uh, to overcome some of the issues that that I talked about but certainly that um, Queenstown is no much better than I do um Bringing the questions back to more the near term as opposed to longer term and, and transition, um, can you provide any insight onto the path out of red traffic light settings? Uh, well, I think the Prime Minister herself has said that we go, that Cabinet is going to consider um, the settings framework, sorry, not the framework, just settings themselves, uh, on the 4th of April. Um, keeping in mind, and, and people have tended to forget this, is that the settings were purely put in place to allow us to manage in our communities with the presence of COVID, but understanding the stresses on our health system. And so, um, 
you know, until we understood what stresses COVID was placing on our health system, it was very difficult for us to move down. Now we have a much better feel for what is happening across the country. And so with, you know, armed with that data and, and those data, I should say, and the information, uh, Cabinet can make a, a better decision on, you know, whether we move from red to orange. The, the sad thing about this, Ruth, is that red was supposed to be about still allowing people to go to their cafes, their local restaurants, down to retail stores and spend in the way that they would ordinarily. But just take the measures like, you know, mask wearing and social distancing um, and hand washing into play. Unfortunately, what's happened is that people, a lot of people with COVID in the community have taken a very risk averse stance and, and who could blame them uh, and stayed away. So, you know, one of the things I do as a local MP is instead of meeting constituents in my office, um, I try to, you know, just go to a whole lot of local cafes and meet them there. But um, once, you know, I think everyone has a better understanding of where COVID is heading, I think that will remove, um, I was going to say the level of fear, maybe that's a little harsh, but certainly people are a little bit reticent to go out to places where there are a whole lot of other people. But, but 4th of April, watch the space, I think that's when Cabinet is assessing the, uh, the red settings. Certainly encouraging government departments that it is that it is safe to travel would possibly be a, a good start at us seeing some more movement around the country and being able to meet people um, face to face. Ruth, the next time I speak to the chamber, I promise it'll be face to face. I would much prefer to come down there and eyeball your members, never glass of wine afterwards, and talk about the issues than be on Zoom. Zoom has a place of that, there's no doubt, and it's better than nothing. But I'm with you. As soon as people can get back to the office and back to work. Um, the better for all of us, and certainly those who rely on the, you know, the inner city workers to be uh, to be in the office from nine to five. Uh, we've just had another question come in that you seem frustrated by the pace of destination management plans, but to get all the players to buy into a new way of working is a massive task, especially in our district. How do we balance your desire for pace and the need to take the time to create new collaborations? Look, I, I you know, I, I don't think it's that difficult. If I'm honest, I know there are. There are a number of key stakeholders across a wide range of industries and areas. Uh, and I'm not just talking about tourism because, you know, when you're talking about tourism in a place like Queenstown, it affects everyone, right? Um, but, you know, I, I think it's taken too long for a number of these organisations to, to, A, put the meat on, the, to, or to come up with a framework and then go out and consult and put the meat on that framework, put the meat on the bones of, you know, of a decent strategy and then articulate that in a way that everyone buys into. Um, it, it's not easy because I'm asking um, regional tourism organisations to do things differently. But, you know, we, we, we've talked about two years here, two years where places like Queenstown in particular, um, you know, have, have suffered a lot. And certainly pre-COVID, and, you know, let's not hide these facts, in, in, the, in the only survey, in the latest survey pre-COVID, 70% of people in Queenstown said there were too many international tourists. I mean, that, that's the facts. And so in terms of building tourism back in Queenstown, uh, you know, the, the RTO needs to understand some of those frustrations that existed beforehand, seek to find solutions to those issues, and then get buy-in from all stakeholders, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the local business people, or those who are just, you know, can't find a park at any time of the day. But, you know, it's, it is about consulting, it's about painting a vision, but it shouldn't take two years to do. It shouldn't even take a year to do, in my view. I would make a comment um, about the 70% who felt that there were too many international tourists, that uh, Queenstown is one of the most diverse uh, towns, areas in the country. And a lot of those accents you hear on the streets have actually are residents and are Kiwis and have lived here for a long time. So there could potentially be the perception that we had a lot of international tourists when a lot of them had actually just been drawn to the great it's, place. No, we, th those aren't my figures. Those are figures that came from Queenstown residents when they were last served So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't dare suppose to presume what Queenstown uh, residents think, but Queenstown residents themselves pre-COVID, an example, you know, we had 940,000 people uh, visit Milford Sound in the year before COVID. I mean, I don't think that is sustainable. I don't think that that is delivering on brand New Zealand. When you consider that, I would wager 50% of the posters advertising our wonderful country uh, in, in real estate offices and businesses around the world are based probably on iconic Milford Sound or Mount Cook or, or the Queenstown scenery you see. So. 
if we don't live that brand, if we don't live up to our brand promises, then there is only one way and it's down. And hence the reason why I keep talking about high value um, tourists. Delivering on Brand New Zealand is something that our local businesses are exceptionally passionate about. And the one thing that they are definitely losing sleep about at the moment is staff availability and immigration settings and their ability just to deliver uh, in, in the coming months. What do you say to those businesses? Um, well, two things I'd say. First of all, my understanding is immigration in New Zealand at this point in time, or to the 20, to, to this day, has approved 2,918 working holiday visas. Um, the Prime Minister and I asked Tourism New Zealand to work with Immigration New Zealand to see what they could do in terms of promoting um, the work visa uh, to you know, in, in a lot of their destinations. It's not uh, Tourism New Zealand's key competency in any way, shape or form, but they have ideas around how they could do this. Um, but you know, when you say that delivering on brand New Zealand is a major focus, uh, I, I do believe that 100%. But I have, you know, like I said, I've been down to Queenstown. It's over six or seven times since I've been Minister of Tourism over the last 18 months. And, and there was one time in particular, I had a really bad service experience, actually, to the point where I, I actually phoned up the mayor and told him about it. That I was that annoyed with, with such poor service and a reasonably expensive bar paying a lot of money for a reasonably average drink that I thought, you know, this bar owner, and I should have called the owner of the bar, not the mayor, really needs to take his, staff, his or her staff aside and say, hey, you know what, you need to deliver on the brand promises we're making as a business. But, you know, um, when people say, oh, you know, we're having to pay above the minimum wage to get staff, my response to that is, well, um, you know, at least people are, are earning a, you know, decent money they can spend in your local community. Um, I have no problem with people earning above the minimum wage in Queenstown in any way, shape or form. Well, you'll be pleased to hear that uh, the Queenstown business people uh, paid over twice the national average wage increase in the last 12 months. So mm -hmm. certainly certainly well on well on track and certainly looking after, after their people. Uh, you may also be interested to hear that immigration doesn't consider bonuses or incentives or any other support that's provided by businesses uh, when considering those wages. We have a lot of businesses that support our their people, particularly into accommodation, um, in some cases up to 60% or more. Mm. And whilst the Holidays Act requires them to take that into account for entitlements, unfortunately, it doesn't, it isn't taken into account by Immigration New Zealand. Uh, Yes, thank you for the investment in Tourism New Zealand about the working holiday visas. So we are working closely with them and we'll be working with our businesses to um, feed that demand into them into them directly for this, for this winter. It's a very exciting initiative. We appreciate it's a pilot. We would like to see it um, extended. Uh, we would also um, like the consideration given to potentially offering people the opportunity to have a working holiday visa in New Zealand who've already had one previously, given that that advertising will also reach people who have previously been through, through here. Yep, let's keep talking about that. Uh, we've got a couple of other ones have come in and I'm conscious we've just got a handful of minutes um, left, Minister, so I appreciate your time this evening. Uh, we have, I support your thoughts with regards to a more sustainable district in the future and brand promises, but how would you suggest businesses that are looking at paying immigrant staff in the future 27 an hour when they currently pay Kiwis minimum, so their wage bill will rise, which would possibly mean the experience price will rise dramatically? Um, has this been put in place so as not to attract as many visitors? No, not in any way, shape or form. Well, two things I would say. First of all, let, let's keep let's keep the two visas that we're talking about distinct. So you've got your accredited employer work visa, right? That's where you've got to pay a minimum of the median wage. And then you've got your working holiday visa. Now, you don't have to pay the median wage of working holiday visa. I'd love to see people pay the median wage. But again, it's about... And how do I say this? I don't want to tell businesses how they should be doing business in any way, shape or form. And I'm not that arrogant. But in a previous life, I was a strategist and used to write strategy documents for large organizations. And I, um, yeah, but all, all I will say is that uh, we've provided a reasonable amount of money to Queenstown businesses uh, that will allow them to take a good, allow them to, to get an expert 
to take a good hard look at their business model and determine if in fact it is fit for purpose in a post-COVID world. And those of you who haven't taken up that funding, uh, but, but are worried about the viability of your business model, certainly under the accredited employee employer work visa, if that's the route you wanna go down, then I would urge you, because it's the, the scheme isn't open for that much longer, but I would urge you to take advantage of that opportunity and get an expert to take a look at your business model. And if there are costs that can be taken out or efficiencies that can be gained, then you know the offer is there for us to pay for someone to take a look to see if in fact you could run your business more efficiently. But but you know, I'm not going to tell people what they should and shouldn't do, but I do think that it would be a wise move if people are concerned to, to seek expert advice that we will pay for. Uh, Minister, Australia has just announced, uh, obviously, the removal of pre-departure testing. Um, what's your view on when we're likely to see that here in New Zealand? What's the space? I'm mean, like, I can't give you a date, Ruth. Um, the, the thing that I will say is um, I've, I've sat around the cabinet table for the last two years for, for nearly every single COVID decision uh, that's been made by cabinet. And, you know, the Prime Minister herself has said we haven't necessarily got everything right. Um, but at the heart of every single decision we make is the health and well-being of, of our diverse communities. And, you know, we, we make decisions with that at the forefront of everything we do and keeping in mind every single cabinet paper that we review and, and are asked to make a decision on, uh, there is information in there from, from Treasury, from MSD, um, from MB, from WorkSafe. So there is a lot of information and a lot of detail and data that we are asked to consider uh, when we are required to make decisions on either increasing or relaxing um, COVID uh, measures. So, you know, we're, we're, we're moving as fast as we believe we should be moving. Um, that's all I'll say. But again, um, please don't think that we've gone to sleep on this. This is still at the forefront um, of a lot of cabinet business as we sit around that cabinet table and, uh, and you know, talk and debate about what the future will look like and what we need to do to keep our community safe. Uh, Minister, one of the challenges that businesses found in gaining financial support, and even when it was government backed, is that lending, of course, is always subject to bank criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, would there potentially be future opportunities to consider alternate government backed financing to support investments in businesses to help them transition? Yes, there will be. And it's something the Minister of Finance and I are working on at this point in time. I mean, I, I can't make any announcements at the moment, but we do recognise that with shallow capital markets and, and banks that um, that I don't think are particularly friendly to business investors. Uh, we believe there's a gap in the market. I've, I asked MB in my role as Minister for Small Business to do some analysis in this space, which they've done. Um, hence the, the basis of the work that the Minister of Finance and I are undertaking at this point in time. So it's very, in terms of my small business hat, but also I, I recognise there are periphery port, um, tourism and economic development portfolio um, responsibilities there, but it's something we are aware of and that we are looking at. Thank you very much for your time um, this evening, Stuart. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, the last points I would leave you with is we would certainly appreciate continuing to talk about how we can support people with, with staffing. We know that we... We live in a globally competitive environment, not just for businesses, but also for people. Uh, and people will be critical to helping us uh, transition uh, and become more diverse and more sustainable in the long term. And we would also like to continue the discussions around investing in key infrastructure, such as power, digital, education and housing, which will also underpin a su successful future for all of us. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you for those who, uh, who have logged on and listened. Um, I, as mentioned, I've, I've come to love Queenstown as a district. I've come to admire and respect uh, the people. I've, I have a number of friends down there and new friends that I've made in the last 18 months. Every now and again, when I'm heading down there, I do look on Trade Me to see if there's any properties I could afford. Unfortunately, they're still out of my, uh, out of my reach. But, um, you know, let's make sure that next time we do speak, and I'm, I'm very, very happy, Ruth, to continue to come down and update your members. Um, let's make sure it's, uh, you know, it's, it's in person, we can enjoy a fantastic, I was going to say a fantastic Hawke's Bay wine, I can't say that when it comes to Queenstown, can I? No, you cannot. Uh, Central Otago wine and, um, and have some of these face-to-face -face conversations, because I do recognise it is a little bit hard uh, on Zoom to really get a feel 
for the room. But but once again, thank you very much for the invitation uh, and thank you for listening. Hugely appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Um, and as always, we are very interested in your feedback on this evening's session with Minister Nash. Thank you. Thank you.